the United States a security state because of the ways in which its mode of governing has been changing over the years. So what I see is that in the US, over many decades of neoliberalism, the state has retreated from its mandate and from the way that it legitimizes itself by providing for citizens by instead doing what I call securitizing them. That means it's saying militarism, securitization, surveillance, protection of threats from others is the way in which we provide welfare for you. So it's changing social security into militarized forms of security. And in addition, what I look at in my book is the way in which citizens themselves have internalized this. People who want to be called citizens, who feel they are citizens, who aspire to be citizens, enact this kind of security. They internalize this. So they replace the state, the work that the state should do and used to do, for instance, around providing welfare, providing all kinds of other ways in which uh, the safety net was there for people. And I have to say it was there for a lot of people, not of color, but mostly of white people. But even that has become reduced at the present time. So we see the greater reductions of benefits to citizenship, but a lot of people aspiring to be citizens by taking on securitizing, criminalizing, policing as modes of enacting their own citizenship as well. So the, the security state is not just what the state has become, but the way in which citizens themselves see what they are as citizens of the security state. So I do put this patriarchy at the center of this empire, but the patriarchy is not just any patriarchy. I modify patriarchy by thinking of it as a white patriarchy, as a Euro-American patriarchy, and that racialization of patriarchy is really critical to understand patriarchy's hierarchy of power. So there are many masculinities that are seen to be marginalized, disenfranchised in this notion of patriarchy. And I think about it as a patriarchy because it's only a few who accrue the benefits of it. Right? So one can say that in some ways um, the idea of racism and white privilege accrues to all white men, but there are differences in the ways in which benefits accrue to them. So the 1% or the 0.1% seems to be gaining all the benefits of this kind of patriarchy. Not just patriarch, it's, it's oligarchic, I might say, in its modality of economic power. So that's really central to the ways in which politics in this country are run, right? Super rich people seem to be giving vast amounts of money to the political, to the politicians and the political machinery and accruing benefits from that, that which they are given, right? So what they give in terms of white privilege are sort of important forms of power that are given to white men. It's not that they're not important, but they're different from the oligarchic power. So what white men have as part of white privilege, and I argue this in the book, is that for instance, they have the second amendment. They have the rights over their families. They have a rights, they're the only group that can carry guns with impunity in this country. Uh, and against all reasonable, rational evidence that guns uh, allow young people and their own white young children to be killed, white men, adult white men, want to retain the right to keep guns. And they keep getting these guns despite the fact that many um, background checks will disallow them to carry guns. All kinds of reasons they shouldn't have them, but they seem to be having them all the time. So they have the right to shoot anybody from the window of the hotel. Who else has that right? So in some ways, certain groups of white men get differential rights of privilege that accrue to them through racialization, right? And so, it, so I want to think about this as a more complicated, hierarchized patriarchy that is racialized in, and class is really critical for this as well.
this is, it seems apparent as a paradox that security and humanitarianism are two distinct and diametrically different modalities of power and governance, but I see them as complementary, that they work together for maintenance, for people trying to maintain their presence as citizenship, their participation in the American, you know, ideal of the empire as well. And the way that this is linked to the question of security is that, again, what humanitarianism does is it evacuates welfare, it evacuates rights, it takes away all that modern states were supposed to give to all their citizens, it takes away all the logic of even the international regimes or the treaties that the U.S. has signed. But, you know, the U.S.'s history around treaties is not that great. But uh, what it does is that it replaces the power of the citizenry, of democracy, with the power of the wealthy. And these are really wealthy white men. And so what philanthropy does is when we see really, really wealthy people as philanthropists, as humanitarians, what we then end up doing is justifying their ability to have that much money their ability to extract that many profits from people. And what they do is that they evacuate democratic rights, right? So what they decide, philanthropists, rich philanthropists in our country decide who gets welfare and who doesn't. Who, who's, what democracy means and what, does, what it doesn't mean. So they seem to be uh, justifying their own existence, their own extraction of vast profits. And these profits are on a scale that is unfathomable to ordinary people among us. And this is uh, when you see Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates justifying their existence by saying they are philanthropists, you have to ask why are they allowed to have that much money? What is, the, what is behind the kinds of systems of extraction, of taxation that allow these to happen? And in fact, what then that humanitarianism contributes to, because it cannot replace the welfare state at all, what it contributes to is greater inequality and greater disaffection, protest movement, struggles that then have to be repressed by militarization, by securitization of people. So we see greater policing uh, being directed towards putting down protest movements, going after Antifa, support, uh, protesters, all of those people. So I do think that these two modalities of power are very complementary. They have to, they work together. Well, I would add another one to it, the missionaries. And the missionaries. And the missionaries are really critical. Um, so each of these, as I said about the book, one of the of the arguments I make in the book is that securitization is not just the work that the state is doing or the police is doing, but we are all asked to participate in it, to become good citizens, to become proper citizens. And so we participate in this project of securitization. And one of the ways that reasons for doing this actually is that we see that the US is losing power and many of these citizens want to shore up that imperial power of the U.S. state. So they participate in it in all kinds of ways. I've talked about the shooter as this white man who was allowed to have guns and to kill anyone with impunity. That seems to be such a big modality of this kind of securitization power that I talked about. Um, these other figures are really critical. What the missionary does is the missionaries uh, argument is that it's only a particular kind of Christian missionary who can represent the nation, right? Who can be the humanitarian, but also who can show how, um, how humanitarian the U.S. state is. So evangelical churches, Mormon churches, send their people all over the world all the time. And what happens is that they are spreading their version of neoliberal evangelical Christianity all over the world, right? In this game, in this kind of competition between missions, for instance, um, Catholicism is losing out, one, because of the sexual 
abuse claims, and secondly, because it's been overtaken by neoliberal evangelical Christianity. So those are really critical people for this. And they also believe in overseas missions versus working in their own communities and working on people of color in America as well. So they always believe that they can go outside the, the US and they can do their missionary work and they can do their charitable and humanitarian work because those people seem to them to be more receptive than local people who want to struggle against their whiteness. So this is a, a key modality of missionary work that happens. Um, and then the, I look at the women as part of this because not just the security moms, but security feminists and the ways in which new kinds of forms of securitization, technology, surveillance technology allows everyone to surveil each other and themselves. Right? So mothers surveil their children, uh, friends can surveil each other. There's all kinds of technologies available that will tell you, you know, you can tell if a friend is nearby and you can meet, you can meet with them. All, you know, all, all sorts of ways in which you know the whereabouts of everyone else. So the ways in which we think about securitization is that we become surveillance machines ourselves because of the ways in which these technologies work. Okay. And so participation in surveillance is really critical. Also because when we participate in this, corporations vacuum up all of our information. And they are then asked by the government to share their information with them. So we had those uh, back in the Bush era after 9-11, massive scandal about warrantless wiretapping, all kinds of ways in which the Bush administration was wanted to get information from media companies, media corporations. And they still do that because I look at the ways in which the laws to protect us against that are so weak that they are absolutely ineffective. So I look at the ineffectiveness of these laws as critical to the machine of surveillance that all people who want to see themselves as citizens have to be participants in. There are several takeaways from my book. I would say the first one I want to say is that I would like all of us as scholars and activists who work on gender, on race, uh, on class, on all of these progressive activist scholarly work to engage with the security regimes and to interrupt them. So we are never seen as, as experts in security, but we really are. And we need to interrupt the, the, the infrastructure of the security, geopolitics as security that is peopled by you know, think tanks, people who comes out of certain kinds of scholarly work that does not include gender or race or sexuality or any of that. So I want us to intervene in security studies, to be, think of ourselves as critical security studies and to be part of that uh, project as well. To think of security in, in sort of complex ways, um, even as we try to to understand the affective notion of security, which is the kind of ways in which uh, one can desire security, uh, safety, all of these things against the, the sort of militarized apparatus and securitized apparatus. So I want us all to participate in that security and to interrupt it. Um, second thing I want to do is to think about how um, neoliberalism is not the same everywhere. But the neoliberalism changes over a period of time. So in my book, I look at uh, what's happening to the US after several decades of neoliberal policies that have led us to have uprisings, great inequalities, people protesting, all kinds of movements. And Trump is just one extreme response to maintaining the last kind of dregs of neoliberal power. Uh, but it's also, but he's also where you can see so much of the contradictions of it. And that's why he's such a fraught figure and such an extreme figure too. Um, so I think that 
what that makes you think about is both the specificities of modality of the U.S., its own neoliberalism, how it's changing with time. So that's why I look at imperial version of neoliberalism, which is its humanitarianism, its surveillance regimes, the way that it produces these technologies of surveillance that, that are really uh, creating violence everywhere. Right? I also want to look at how securitization affects the domestic space. That's been a big part of what I do, and I take this from all the work on imperialism that has brought the international and the domestic together. As a scholar of transnational studies, I always think about the domestic as being made in relation to the international and the other way around. So I want to think about those two, two those spaces together. So I look at the ways in which the wars that are ongoing affect what goes on in the U.S. and the ways in which racialization and policing in all these things affect international relations too. So that two-way street of that. Um, the other thing I want to say on a very everyday way is that we ought not to be so fearful that surveilling each other, surveilling our friends, surveilling our children is not what we should be doing. So it's an anti-fear, anti-surveillance project, which really looks at the ways in which surveillance is produced through all kinds of these new bells and whistles and products that are being sold to, them, sold to us. And they always promise that we will have greater protection, greater security, greater surveillance, and that never happens. So we keep buying more and more products. So the commodity part of this is really critical to think about how the economy works in terms of selling us commodities of security and how important that has become in a securitized regime. Right? Um, the last thing I will say is that I also, with a lot of other scholars who have worked on this, I want to argue that humanitarianism and philanthropy are not the answer to the world's problems, not the answer to inequality, not the answer to poverty, not the answer to racism, not the answer to any of that. So it is, we need to see philanthropy, especially the philanthropy of the rich, as being what it is. The ways in which the wealthy want to control who gets welfare and who doesn't, who gets, who gets to live, and in Foucault's formulation, who is let die. So we need to see that for what it is, right? But we also need to see the ways in which the logics of humanitarianism are being part of our everyday lives. Um, the ways in which we are asked to volunteer, to do all kinds of work that is unpaid and unremunerated, that takes away from our time. The technologies that ask us to work all the time without pause, with no time off, and they attract us, in fact, to do that kind of work, right? So, so we need to understand, I think, the modalities of corporate products, commodifications, imperialism, and securitization as producing these kinds of new sorts of citizens. But at the same time, we need to also see the forms of repression, securitization, that come down on people who protest this. So I see also this as an era of great protest. Right? And that era of great protest is protest coming from the right and it's protest coming from the left. So there's very revanchist movements of white supremacy that are emerging, but there are also Antifa, anarchism, all kinds of other movements, uh, against inequality, against racism, Black Lives Matter, indigenous rights. We see all of these movements uh, also coming up more and more to the surface, not to mention uh, the struggle against sexual harassment and violence against women. I see them all as sort of the neoliberal era of protest that is being repressed by a security state.